today we continue with part two of our series entitled Walk the Walk. As we're looking at what it means to have unity in the church, what it means to have Christians that are committed to following the Lord, not just when it's convenient or when they feel like it, but rather to walk worthy of their calling by which they've been called. To walk worthy of that high calling that God has upon their lives. Now, our theme for our series, uh, really our theme verse is found in uh, chapter 4, verse 1. It's from our previous study where it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And this is such a powerful, poignant statement. This is such a an amazing request that Paul is saying to the church, walk worthy of your calling. God has done so much for you. And we're not only given this commission, but we're given the how-tos, if you will, for walking worthy of our calling. And if you recall, those things were walking with lowliness and gentleness, long-suffering, and bearing with one another in love. And ultimately, we concluded from our last study that it's just being like Jesus. Walking as Jesus would walk. Living as Jesus would live is what makes you worthy of your calling. Really, that practical aspect of walking worthy of our calling affects the whole church. If you're like Jesus, then the way that that's going to affect others is going to blow their minds. See, the problems and disunity comes in the church when we're not behaving like Christ and when we're not living like Him. So if in our last study, we learned of the how we are to walk worthy of our calling, this study is going to be the why we are to walk worthy of our calling. And really, under the umbrella of unity in the church, being one with the Lord and being one with each other, all comes now to point number one in our message today, the Lord is one. The Lord is one. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is part of what is referred to in the Hebrew language as the Shema. This was a confession of faith in who God is. Uh, he's an actual person. Often people think that God is an impersonal force. In 1 Corinthians 6, actually 8, 6, it says, Yet for us there is one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we for Him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. There is one God. He had one Son. There is one body. There is one spirit. All because the Lord is one. And it is for God and through Jesus that we live. As it says in Acts 17 verse 28, For in Him we live and move and have our being. We live, we move, we have our being in Christ. So, Building upon the Christian walking worthy of his calling by living like Christ and making an effort to keep the unity of, uh, in the bond of peace, we now see in verse 4 that it says, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. Here in verse 4, we have two great Greek words that you can remember very easily. And it is soma and pneuma. It is the body and spirit. Soma and Numa. We are one in Christ and are one with each other in His body called the church. The body of Christ is the church. And there is only one body of Christ. Now, you don't have multiple bodies. You have one body. And you have one mind. And you have one spirit. We may have liked to have multiple bodies, but we don't. We have one. You're given one at birth and you're going to die in that same body later on in life. And you have one spirit. Even so, too, there is only one church and there is only one body of Christ. This is important to understand because there will be people and, they, and they'll say something to the effect, hey, we're all God's kids. We're all God's kids. And you've probably heard somebody say that, hey, we're all, we're all God's children. Well, you know, we were all created by Him and we were all created in His image. That is fact. But to know Him... 
uh, is really the purpose of why we were created, to know Him and then from that place live our lives. But according to what John 1 verse 11 through 12 says, it says that Jesus came to His own and His own did not receive Him. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. And so whether or not it's a euphemism for our culture today, the fact of the matter remains that you are a child of God through faith in Jesus. There is only one God, there is only one church, there is only one Son of God, there is only one Holy Spirit, and you are either in or you're out. Those that place their faith in Jesus are sons, are daughters. That's it. Because he says those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Now, as I mentioned, I don't know any of you that have two bodies, and I'm not referring to really the before or after pics either. We have one body to live here on the earth, and there's only one body of Christ, one church, and the church are those that have placed their faith in the only Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now, I know that might sound a little redundant, but we need to understand this because what we're going to get into in just a few moments is very important for us today. Next, we'll see that there is only one Holy Spirit. This is important because there are a lot of evil spirits in the world and they can masquerade as angels of light. They appear good, they appear nice, they appear great. Even the things working behind the scenes, it might look moral, it might look acceptable, it might seem like it's doing a good deed or it's kind or whatever it might be. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, listen to what John said. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You know, I've been blown away. On, I'm not on Twitter very much, and I forgot that I used to use Twitter a lot. And I went on it last night, and I started just scrolling through followers and, and looking through, you know, what I used to do on Twitter. And some of the things that I was seeing that were being written and that were linked and that were tagged and that were posted by people that were either one, you know, connection off or or whatever, I was disturbed because I started seeing this massive trend, this massive trend with young people not believing what the Bible says, calling themselves Christians, even calling themselves pastors in some cases, but completely denying what God's Word says. There is a spirit of deception that is in the world today that is leading people to believe that you can call yourself a Christian and not believe in God's Word. Or you can kind of, you know, get your little scissors out and cut out the sections that you don't like, and then, you know, it's still okay. Or we'll try to rationalize sin, we'll condone sin. And I'm blown away at some of the things that I saw just last night. I couldn't believe it. And I thought, what in the world is happening today where Christians do not base their life upon what God's Word says, but rather upon what they think? What they think. I think this or I feel that is the preface for their whole doctrine. And that's unbelievable. And so we have to be careful about that. And for those of you that have grown up in the church and you've had a solid you know, upbringing, if you will, in God's Word and what God's Word says about the Holy Spirit and how He works through His people and through the church and through His Word, then great for you. Not everybody is as fortunate as that. So how do you test the spirits? John said to his beloved, test the spirits whether they are of God. How do I know if something is of God? Maybe you've asked yourself that question. Maybe you've wondered that very thing. Like, how do I just know if this is the right thing to do or not? You start by testing the Spirit. And that comes through God's Word. God's Word. Back in my early days at Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa, I was only 24 at the time. And I was uh, the youngest guy that was on staff there, and this woman came up to me saying that she was a Christian after our first service, and she said, you know, I'm a Christian, and, you know, can you please pray for me, uh, because I have an unclean spirit that's living inside of me. And I looked at her like, is this sort of a joke or, or what? And I thought, you know, well, actually, this, this isn't. And she started to explain, you know, her situation, 
how, you know, this, this, this dark shadow came into her or whatever. And I started to explain to her, I'm like, listen, if you said you're a Christian and you put your faith in Jesus, God isn't going to share you with anyone. Okay, that's what it means when we talked about being sealed with the Holy Spirit as our guarantee. It means God's not going to share you with anyone. Behold, Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in, and then that door shuts. There is no sharing you once you belong to Christ. And I explained that to her, and she proceeded to insist that she had an unclean spirit. And so I asked her, I said, well, have you given your life to Jesus? And then she couldn't remember. She's like, I don't know. I thought I did. Well, I can't really remember if I did or not. And so I started sharing with her the Romans road, which is, you know, Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, Romans 5.8, Romans 10.9, Romans 10.10, 11, and 13, which is really how you lead somebody uh, to an understanding of, hey, sin separates you from God, and God demonstrated his love towards you, and that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. And if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know, and as I started to share the word, of God with her she started convulsing and she started shaking and then this voice came out of her that said I am an unclean spirit and I was like oh my gosh yes you are and uh, you and I grabbed these guys and we started praying for her and she ended up you know running out of the out of the church sanctuary and it was the craziest thing I had ever dealt with and little did I know I would be dealing with those things over the next you know 10 years being a pastor there at the church but you test the spirits Something doesn't seem right about this, or something is contradictory to God's word. Something doesn't add up. It just seems weird. It's probably because it is weird. And when we have the word of God, that is our compass, that is our foundation, that is the, the, the very thing that we view our life and the world. It's called a biblical worldview. It's how we look at our world and our circumstances and our situations and even our decision making is based upon God's word. Because if you're left with my theology is what I feel it should be or what I think it should be, you are off. And you're going to continue to go way, way off. And then you're going to have people that are going to be so, so out there. They're going to be floating and thinking, you know, hey, well, you know, they're, they're extraterrestrial, so far gone from God's word. And that's when major, major problems happen, is when we look to something other than God's word. When we're allowed to be led by our emotions or by our thoughts instead of the, or even for that matter, deceitful evil spirits working in the world today other than the Holy Spirit. So that's why we must be led by the Holy Spirit. So there is one God. Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. And there is one Holy Spirit. So you test the Holy, you test the spirits and you see if they are of God based upon what God's word says. Now the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a member of the Trinity. This is also important to understand because some people mistake the Holy Spirit for being some kind of vibe or the force. You know, they like the idea, you know, of Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and whatever it might be. And they think of the Holy Spirit as this is the, the Spirit that's flowing through all creatures living. And, you know, there's a balance to it and all of that. No, there's one Holy Spirit. And He only lives inside those that have put their faith in Jesus. Outside of that, He is working in the world for three things, Jesus said. To convict the world of sin, of judgment, and righteousness. And those things are listed in the Gospel of John. And the Holy Spirit's working in the world today, convicting of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. And outside of that, the Holy Spirit is not living inside of anyone other than the man or the woman that has put their faith in Jesus. In Mormonism, the Latter-day Saints, the Holy Spirit is regarded as an impersonal power or a spirit being. Jehovah's Witnesses believe the Holy Spirit is an impersonal force from Jehovah, but not God. And others considered to be Christians as well. Like those that practice Christian science. The Holy Spirit is divine science and the teaching of Christian science. So, many teach that the Holy Spirit is more of an impersonal force rather than a member of the Trinity. But listen, the Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit can be quenched, resisted, insulted, and blasphemed. 
So a couple of things that we need to know about the Holy Spirit this morning is this. The Holy Spirit regenerates us spiritually. Makes you alive spiritually. In Titus 3 verses 4 through 5 it says, But when the kindness and the love of our God our Savior toward man appear, who is Jesus? Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, now listen to this, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's why we say, Lord, fill us afresh with Your Holy Spirit today. Wash us, cleanse us, renew us. Regeneration means being made alive. Though you were dead in sins, He makes you alive spiritually. This is through faith in Jesus alone. So without faith in Jesus, whether you grew up in the church, whether you think you know of God, or you're born in America and went to Sunday school, apart from faith in Jesus, you are not regenerated. You are unregenerated. More than likely, like all of us, you are degenerate because of your sinful nature. And when we're... When we put our faith in Jesus, we're made alive spiritually. What a great thing that is. So the Holy Spirit regenerates us. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. The Holy Spirit is active in the sanctification process. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says. He says, and such were some of you. You were sinners, living sinful lifestyles, but you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and, listen to this, by the Spirit of our God. So we are rejuvenated spiritually. We are set apart from the world because the Holy Spirit has sealed us according to what we saw in Ephesians 1.3. So the Holy Spirit leads us, empowers us, teaches us gives us spiritual gifts as we're going to see in our next study which is going to be pretty exciting if you ever wonder what your spiritual gift might be and so as the church we're united by our faith in Jesus we're united by the indwelling of our Holy Spirit and so when you don't like your brother or sister in Christ they have the same Holy Spirit dwelling in them that you do and you are joined together as the family of God that's why he says endeavoring to keep the bond of unity in the Spirit, the bond of peace in the Spirit. And this is what we're to do as the church. So we see there is one body, there is one Spirit, and next we see in verse 4, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One hope. Hope is such a powerful thing, especially when it's a hope that doesn't disappoint. You know, we put our hopes in a lot of different things, don't we? You know, at Christmas time, you may have hoped to get that Lego set and it just fell through that year. You know, uh, you may have put your hope in, in, you know, a system or another person or whatever it might be, and it just fell through and it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out. You were disappointed. See, the Bible tells us in Romans 5, 5, that now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We have a hope in the Lord that will never fail. This world will be terrible at times. We'll have terrible struggles. We will have disappointments in man because man lets us down, but that doesn't mean that God ever will. God, even in our, in our scripture reading this morning, as we're reading through the Psalms, how the psalmist said, Lord, I would not have learned the precepts that you have given if it were not for the affliction that you allowed me to go through, as I paraphrase that passage. And we see that even through difficult times, the Lord is teaching and he is molding and He is shaping. We have a hope in the Lord. Something that is far greater than anything that this world has to offer. And this is the very thing that we hold on to in the times where we're just tested to the max. There is only one hope for the world and His name is Jesus Christ and we're celebrating His birth in December. Why do you think it's the best time of the year? Why do you think it's the most exciting holiday? Why do you think everybody... I mean, that's just an extrapolated connection to the birth of Christ. Because it is the hope for mankind. And our hope as Christians is that Jesus is coming to take us home again. Because He said, where I am, you may be also. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm going to come for you. 
That's what our expectation should be for. Lord, I know you're coming again. I have that hope that whatever happens in this world, Lord, if I die, to be absent from the body is to be present with you, O Lord. Lord, in this world, I know that you're coming back and I live with that hope, with that expectancy. And so when I'm having problems, Lord, my hope is in you. And so as the church, if we're living like Christ and we're living like Him, walking worthy of our calling with lowliness and gentleness, bearing with one another, if we are, we are endeavoring and working and putting effort into making sure we keep the peace, as Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. As we are endeavoring and, we are, and as we are in that place of saying, you know what, death to self, let's keep the unity in the body of Christ. Let's stay as one. We're members of the same body, the same Holy Spirit dwells inside of us, and we have the hope All of us have the hope of the second coming of Jesus. We have that hope. You have that hope. I have that hope. Warren Wiersbe said this, and I quote, Paul was suggesting here that the believer who realizes the existence of the one body, who walks in the Spirit, and who looks for the Lord's return, is going to be a peacemaker and not a troublemaker end of quote. I love that. You realize, hey, we're one body in Christ. And you know, as much as my right hand might hate my left hand, if I hit my left hand because I hate it, my whole body hurts. I feel that pain. So the church that is staying together and loving each other and watching out for each other, walking in the Spirit, walking worthy of your calling, And then also, it says, looking for the Lord's return. Lord, you're coming quick. I want to be ready when you come, Lord, because you're going to come at a moment when I'm not expecting it, and I want to be ready for it. And so now the church is expecting it, and because we're expecting it, we're out there sharing the gospel with our neighbors and with the grocers and with our, uh, with our, with our associates and with the guy that, you know, is, is teaching our, our, our kids uh, at school, and, and we're involved in our community. We're letting our light shine. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I don't have time to fight with other people that are Christians. Christians. I refuse to because we're on the same team. Why should we have this separation? Why should the one body of Christ hurt each other? This is ridiculous. We're more concerned with the important things. People are going to hell. They need Jesus and we need to walk worthy of our calling and we need to be ready for the second coming of Jesus. So the Lord our God is one God and so are we as His body. Point number two is this. The Lord is above and beyond. Verse five, it says, there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, (laughs) For those that are kind of like, you know, I don't like Christianity because it's just so narrow. It doesn't get any more narrow than this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. Except by me. Someone wants to get mad at Christians. I don't like what you Christians, you know, concocted. Hey, we didn't create that. Jesus said it. If you have a problem with that, then you can take that up with Jesus, not me. I didn't come up with that. They look at what Paul writes here. There's one faith. There's one Lord. There's one baptism. Listen, there is only one Lord and His name is Jesus Christ. In Philippians 2, verses 9-11, through 11, it says, Therefore God has also highly exalted Jesus and given Him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's who we serve. There is only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Now, What I'm about to say isn't politically correct, and I don't think you come to our church for political correctness, but rather for biblical accuracy. Jesus is not what any other religion or book says He is other than the Bible. If you want to know who Jesus is and what things He said, then study the Bible. 
Often there will be those from different religions that will say that we all worship the same God, but we just call Him by different names. There could not be anything further from the truth. Because there is only one God, and if you don't believe in the God of the Bible, then we do not believe in the same God. Period. That's it. And I'm not saying this because we're hateful or unloving. We're saying this because that's what God's Word tells us, and it's the truth. We do not believe in the same God unless we believe together in the God of the Bible. That's it. His name is not any other name than what is said here in God's Word. And if you are worshiping a God that is not the God of the Bible, then you are not part of the one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body, one spirit. But because we believe in the God of the Bible, we have been unified by our faith in Him. We have that unity in the body of Christ. We do not have that with other world religions. You know, there is and has been for some time an ecumenical movement. Ecumenical movement really just means, you know, we're trying to get all world religions together. We all worship the same God. You might call Him this. We call Him that. You call Him this. And there is a move towards that. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that we are trying to go for a one world currency? Why do you think we do not like nationalism? Why do you think that you, the United States of, the America, uh, of America is causing so many problems with the globalists in the world today? A resurgence of national identity. Now, for a globalist, and really what we're going to is that there is going to be a man that steps on the scene in the future who the Bible says is the Antichrist. He is going to be one man who will rule the whole world with one religion somehow and with one world currency. We know this. The Bible tells us. And now, you know, as we get closer and closer to the end of the world and the second coming of Jesus, it's becoming more and more feasible in our intellect to understand, oh yeah, you could have a chip embedded in your hand or in your forehead and you could buy and, you know, sell whatever you want. I mean, years ago, people were like, man, this must be metaphorical or this has got to be some kind of weird, you know, thing that's going to happen. But now that's like they do it with your dog. You know, you lose your dog and they have a little chip in his ear and, it, and you can track him wherever he goes. You know, you can keep his medical records, you know, on that little chip. And the chips are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. You know, I, I mean, if you think about it, how convenient would it be to instead of carrying your wallet around, you just had a little tiny chip, put it in your hand, really small, like so small, it's like smaller than like a, like a little speck of sand. I'd be like, that's no thing. I just scan my hand. You know, I don't know how many people are going to get it on their foreheads. I mean, that would be a little awkward, you know, like that to, to scan it. But, uh, you know, it's like at Costco, let me just scan your forehead instead of, you know, the, the boxes or whatever. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, we'll, we're seeing that happen. Happen. We're seeing that happen. So one world religion, we don't all worship the same God. And, that, and that's, that's the truth. And we need to know that as the church. There's only one body. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. And on the subject of faith, I think just, you know, as a little side note, have you, or rather are you, feeling like your faith is being tested. You don't need to raise your hand, but maybe you're going through a time where your faith is tested right now. Your faith in God. The enemy wants you to throw in the towel, say, forget it, I tried the whole Jesus Christian live you know, my life thing and I'm done. The enemy would love for nothing more than for you to quit. Maybe you've been crying out to God. And I'll, and, I'll, and I'll confess something to you. There, there have been phases, and I look back in my life, and I, and I mostly noticed this, you know, as a high school and in college, and it seemed like it was incremental, that there would be times where I'd pray to the Lord and I didn't feel like I heard anything. And that I was like, Lord, don't you hear? Like, this is kind of important, Lord. You know, and you're praying, you're praying and praying. Maybe you've been experiencing a, a season where you're praying and you feel like you're not hearing anything except for crickets. You know, it's like the proverbial cricket sound, like, you know, in the back, and that's it. And you're like, I don't hear anything from God. I don't hear anything. And then 
your feelings are affected by this because of your thoughts. And what you feel comes from what goes through your mind. So what you feel in your heart is going to come from your thoughts in your mind. And you think to yourself, and I think it's logical, and I think it's understandable, and I would even think that it's rational to say, why? Why? Why, Lord, would you allow this to happen? And then when I call out to you, I don't hear a single thing from you. And you know, maybe you're genuine and you're crying out to the, to the Lord and it may even bring you to tears because you feel as if God doesn't care about you because if He did, why would He allow this to happen? Lord, why would you allow this to happen? And then furthermore, you prayed and nothing immediately changed. And that's a very difficult place to be in. It's a very difficult place to be in. For in that very moment though, the Lord begins to scratch the surface of your faith. It's at that point that it's scratching the surface of your faith that has been buried deep down inside of you. Maybe you've tried conventional wisdom. You've applied all types of different strategies to find a solution. We're good at doing that. We Google it. But then all of a sudden, the layers of your resources are being peeled away like an onion. I mean, we can literally feel like we just get the Lord's voicemail when we pray. It's the weirdest thing. You know, it's almost as if there's this recording, you know, Jesus isn't available right now. Please try again later. Or if it's an automated system, you know, press one and we have some appointments opening up right after the rapture of the church. You know, like, well, that's not going to help me either. Sometimes other people and even our own thoughts mis misrepresent true faith in Jesus. Maybe you're at a place where you're praying and God isn't answering no, but He's also not answering yes. Why do you think that God at times is thought to be remaining silent when we pray? There's one Lord and there's one faith. All right, Lord, I'm in the faith, but why am I just not getting anywhere? I think it's important to ask yourself, is He remaining silent or are we not hearing the reply we are hoping for? If you're honest with yourself, that is a very valid question to ask. Lord, that can't be you because there is no way in the world I would ever do that. <laughs> Lord, that can't be from you because I don't like that. I'll just keep uh, praying until I get the answer that I want. You know, you're like a child just wearing your parent down until finally they say, okay, okay, okay. Lord, I don't hear you. I mean, there is such a thing as selective hearing when it comes to our prayer life. Lord, I'm just waiting to receive the answer that I want to receive from you. Well, listen, sometimes the Lord will say yes. Sometimes He will say no, and sometimes the Lord will say, not right now. Not right now. So it's not a yes and it's not a no, it's just not right this minute. But then that requires waiting, Lord. I don't like waiting. I've been thinking a lot about Abraham lately. Abraham and Sarah, and the Lord told him, he's like, you're going to have a son, and he was 100 years old, and he was completely dead physically. He could not have a child. But it said he didn't waver in his faith. That is mind-blowing to me. It even goes on to say that he was actually at the place where he pressed in more to his faith and hope in God. Why does the Lord, though, not allow an answer to come immediately, though? Why, Lord, do I have to keep calling out to you over and over and over again? Lord, don't you see that my heart is breaking? Is this on a personal level for any of you at this point? Why would the Lord not answer you immediately? Why would the Lord allow you to keep praying over and over and over again? Well, 
I've come to determine in my own life that prayer really is the shovel by which we excavate the sand of our abilities and find the power of faith in a living God. Like just you're scratching the surface, you're unearthing it. It's buried beneath our paycheck and our health and our connections. It's buried beneath our mortgage that we have paid off. It's buried beneath the friends that we have surrounding us. It's buried beneath our family. You know, and all of a sudden, the Lord starts to unearth faith through whatever it is that we're going through. Scratching the surface. I know it's in there somewhere. And then faith becomes a way of life. Listen, we cannot be deterred from making our requests known to the Lord, nor can we be distracted or put off calling out to the Lord. Because what happens? You pray for something one time and you don't get it, and you're like, I'm out. Come on, Lord, make it snappy. I don't have a lot of time for this. Listen, the Lord is working in your life and my life according to His plan, His will. We at times would love to fight against God's plan or at least complain about it, but acknowledging and submitting to God's will is our first priority. Because His priority is to do that which is best for us. And that's the best place that we can be. In Matthew 7, verses 7 through 8, Jesus said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be open. But listen, as Christians, we might receive something that we didn't expect. We might find something we weren't looking for. And we might step through a door that we didn't even know existed because of our time in prayer. So ask for the Lord's help and it will be given to you. Seek the Lord's perfect will for your life and you will find it. Knock on the door of opportunity in every circumstance and the Lord will open our understanding, your understanding. He'll lead you through whatever it is that you're going through. You know, backstage we were just praying before service that you know, there would be real spiritual growth and maturity in our church. Strong faith that doesn't give up. That comes when Christians allow the Lord to have His work, His perfect work, accomplished in their life. And if that's where you're at today, and the Lord's scratching the surface of your faith, do not forget, there is one God. There is one Spirit. There is one Lord. There is one body. There is one faith. And we have a faith that doesn't disappoint. And lastly, from verse 5, there's one baptism. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 13 through 14, it says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many but many you look at your own body there's a lot of different members of your body got five on this hand and five on that hand and five on this foot and five on that foot we're members of the same body so baptized by one spirit one body one baptism back on October 21st we had our baptism what a special day that was we had some that had planned on getting baptized and they got baptized and some not so much and they got baptized anyway that day. But regardless of who you are, you were baptized with one baptism of being baptized in Christ. So whether you were 10 years old, like my son Hudson who was baptized, which I was just so blessed, or you're a grandmother like Jeanette, or somewhere in between, we're all one in, baptize, in baptism. Now, you may have been baptized at Vision City Church, but you weren't baptized into Vision City Church. You were baptized into Jesus. You weren't baptized into our church. We may have performed it. We may have said, hey, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we now baptize you, and 
donkey and bring you up, but you are baptized into Jesus. So whether you are baptized at some other church or baptized here at this church, if you are baptized in Jesus, you are in Jesus. Now there are some churches that will say, you know, um, we don't accept your baptism at Vision City Church because you weren't baptized a certain way. You have to be baptized this way. Well, I just have to tell you that if you were baptized in Jesus at another church, we accept that baptism because there is one baptism and that's of Jesus. And then finally, verse 6, there is one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, contrary to pantheism, we are not all gods, and so we've become culturally ex- conditioned to saying namaste. You go to yoga, and they say namaste. I went to India, and they say namaste. I think the Indian people are some of the most beautiful people I've ever met in my life. I've traveled to India, spent a number of weeks there, and you know, namaste just means we greet the God that's within you. That's what that means. And so, you know, we're not all gods, and we do not... Uh, you know, as pantheism teaches, uh, you know, that we are multiplicity of, of, of gods. Uh, I am not a god, okay, just in case you were wondering. I will never be a god, nor do I ever plan on being a god. Uh, there's only one god, and you aren't either. And if you think you're a god, you're not. And you need to know that, and the truth will set you free today. <laughs> so, God and Father... It says here, as we just finish up with this last verse, uh, we are brothers and sisters and sons and daughters, and we all have the same heavenly Father, and he's not talking to every person in the world. He's speaking to the church. Because remember in John 1, it said, he came to his own and his own received him not. But those who did receive him, he gave them the right to be called the children of God. So you are baptized, you are born again, birthed into a family of God. You are made alive, regenerated as the Holy Spirit makes you alive spiritually. Uh, There is one body, and that is the church. There is one baptism, and that's in Jesus' name. There is one God and one Lord and one Holy Spirit that seals you until the day that Jesus comes to take you home. And so, as it says, in one God and Father of all, we see who is above all and through all and in you all, the Holy Spirit is God, and He lives inside of you. You are not God. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit, as Paul says in Corinthians. And so the same God that is above you and working through you and in you is also the same God, listen to this, in the church and especially for maybe the person that you might be butting heads with, is the same God that is above them and working through them and in them as your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so... That's why there needs to be unity in the church. Now, there are different denominations. And, and, and you know, that's okay. There are different denominations. And there are some things that people will say, you know what, I prefer hymns at every single worship service. And so we have hymns at our service. Um, you know, that, this isn't what, what he's talking about here. You know, I think we need to understand that in the grand scheme of things, the body of Christ are those that have put their faith in Jesus. And that is what saves. There are those that believe in what God's word says. If you start to edit the Bible, if you start to believe that it's not inspired, that it is not inerrant, that it is not fully God's word, then you are actually going off the beaten path and then we are no longer united in Christ because you've chosen to remove yourself from what God's word says. And then that needs to be dealt with on a separate level. So, here we see as we conclude, brothers and sisters in Christ, and they desire unity. Because there is one Lord, one God, and one body called the church. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace with one another. In Romans 12, 18, and this is where where we will conclude, it says, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men but they did this. As much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. But they have what's coming to them. As much as it's within your power, you live at peace with all men. And we do so through the power of the Holy Spirit and in so doing, keep unity in the church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word and we thank you, Father, for all of your blessings. 
We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this place that we can call home. And Lord, I ask, Father, that whether it's me or anyone else that will ever stand behind this pulpit, I pray that the main desire would be to disciple and to equip the saints, Lord, to shepherd the flock that we see as the church and to help, Lord, those that are here grow in their relationship with you. Lord, we pray for spiritual growth and maturity. We ask, Lord, for a commitment to you above all else, Lord, and that as we seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, all these other things shall be added unto us. May we keep our priorities straight. Lord, may we not veer off the path. May we not, Lord, take our foot off the gas when it comes to pursuing holiness and righteousness. Lord, I pray that we would not be fair-weather Christians. I pray, Lord, that we would be followers of you in the thick and in the thin, the good and the bad, the easy and the difficult, Lord, and that we would be men and women that have reputations of being faithful to you. And so, Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you, Lord, that you build your church. We thank you, Lord, that this group of people is your people. And, Lord, we belong to what is your church. And so, Lord, we ask that your hand would be upon this particular uh, section of the body of Christ today. And, Lord, we ask for your blessings now in Jesus' name. And we all say, Amen.